How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Aside from shoveling snow four times today, we're doing okay. Where, what parts of the country do you live in? And then I'm broadcasting, so don't give anything too specific and address anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm in, I'm in Ottawa, Canada, so we've had snow off and on for about the past 24 hours. Okay. Not feeling sick, are you? Oh, God, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit, guys. My <laughs> oh, man. All right. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> do you want to introduce yourself for everybody? Sure. So my name is Phil Gursky, and I'm in Canada. I'm a Canadian. Spent uh, more than three decades in security intelligence in my country. Uh, retired a couple years ago. Written five books on terrorism and consider myself knowledgeable on all things jihadi and all things Iran. How's that for a start? Yeah, that's a good start. Um, so somebody affiliated with you reached out to me to connect us because um, you had opinions relating to the recent assassination of Soleimani. And, Correct. Yeah, and I read an article on... I don't know if it's your website or your company's website or whatever that you had written about his death. Do you want to explain, I guess, briefly your take on that? On, on yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, look, at Stephen, like like most people in the Western world, I you know no love lost for Soleimani and the IRGC and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my model is a simple one. You know, a, a dead terrorist is a good terrorist. Sure. There's one less guy you have to worry about. Follow, investigate, all that kind of stuff. But I think that the assassination falls uh, short on a couple of couple of levels. One is, and we can talk about this more in detail, is, you know, what is the role of the military, whether it's Canadian, American, whatever, in the war on terrorism? I got issue, issues with that. Mm -hmm. I think, secondly, for me, it made us kind of take the eye off the ball, and the eye off the ball is jihadis. So people like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that Iran poses nearly the same level of threat that the jihadis do. Uh, and, and third, and, and, you know, speaking strictly as a Canadian, you know, 63 Canadians died in, in an aircraft that was taken off from Tehran about a week after the assassination when an Iranian military guy uh, thought a passenger aircraft was an incoming American missile or something, shot it down, killed 170 people, including a lot of Canadians. And, you know, I'm not, look, at the blame for that lies solely with Iran. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that shot the, they shot the missile, they're the ones that took out the aircraft. But, you know, it's pretty hard to get there in the sense of what happened without the tension that, it, that had risen as a consequence of Soleimani's assassination and the subsequent Iranian ballistic missiles against U.S. forces on an Iraqi air base. In other words, bottom line is, had that tension not been as high as it was, that aircraft would not have been shot down. I, I, that's just my personal opinion. So, you know, again, Soleimani's dead. Good thing. Uh, he's been a pain in our ass for, for a very long time. I just don't think it's that Iran and the IRGC is our number one threat, and it worries me when we kind of focus on that kind of thing. Sure. What do you, um, what do you think the... Uh, so broadly speaking, what do you think the U.S.'s role in the Middle East should be? Well, I'm curious. That's a really broad question. Sorry. How far back do you want to go? Um, wow. I guess like so for, for a modern day mission. So obviously we're still heavily involved in Afghanistan. We have interests yeah. in in Iraq. Um, I, I guess what, I, what I'm mainly hitting at is the so you made the statement that Iran is not as big a threat to the United States as, say, like ISIS or Al Qaeda. Yeah. Um, but I guess, like, depending on what U.S. interests are in the region, you mm -hmm. might say that somebody like Iran is actually, like, a huge threat. Right. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. like, flipping Iraq over to, like, Syria and, and, Ira and, um, and Iran would represent, like, a grave, like, error in U.S. foreign policy. What do you yeah. think? So, yeah, so I'm kind of, like, questioning, like, what should be, like, the broader focus? Like, what should the U.S. do in, in that region, I, I guess, to secure U.S. interests in, in hopefully a way that doesn't involve killing a bunch of civilians again or anything? Okay. Yeah. So interest can be defined very broadly, right? Yeah. There's economic interest, there's diplomatic interest, there's uh, political interest, etc. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we all have ec economic interests. Let's face it, that's where all the oil is. Although you guys and us in Canada have a lot of oil as well. So mm -hmm. not nearly as important as it used to be. Um, there obviously are political interests. I, I think, you know, what, what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, when it comes to the military and, you know, you're in Afghanistan, we were in Afghanistan for more than a decade. You're still in Iraq, we're still in Iraq with NATO, all that kind of stuff. The problem is, is that as much as those local countries kind of need our help when it comes to military training and, you know, war on terrorism, which is a term that I really hate, by the way, I don't we should call it a war on terrorism. The problem is, is you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. So if you don't go there and help the locals, terrorism is going to thrive. If you do go there and help the locals, terrorism is going to thrive because you become a target. You know, nobody likes to be invaded. No one likes to be occupied. So basically what you're doing is you're giving the bad guys more incentive to kill you. Not that they don't have enough, enough as it is. They want to kill us anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's just, you're not actually helping matters by by staying there. I mean, yeah, yeah, we take out people. Al-Baghdadi's dead, great. You know, we all celebrated that. Bin Laden's dead, great. We all celebrated that. 
But the problem is, David, like, wh where's the end game here? Where's the where's the exit strategy? And, you know, and the Trump administration is now and, and I'm talking to the Taliban, who are the, you know, according to the Global Terrorism Index from last year, are the single greatest terrorist group in on the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and we're talking to them about a peace treaty for Afghanistan. And I was reading recently on a website that I, I consult a lot that the you know, Taliban are only negotiating to get us out of Afghanistan. They have no intentions of being peaceable, bringing democracy to Afghanistan, women's rights, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They just want to see our, the, the, you know, our behinds out of that country. So the, the problem is like when we talk about the military response to this is, yeah, in some ways it's good, but it also causes a lot of problems. So yeah, it's a very long answer to your short question. Mm -hmm. To me, there's got to be a better way of doing this because we haven't solved the Middle East, if, if that's even our goal. I don't know that is our goal. Um, we've all been involved in the area for a very long time. It's not getting any better on, on, on many levels. So what the answer is that? Hey, if I had the answer to that question, you couldn't afford me on your program because I'd be a gazillionaire by this point. Yeah, well, assuming the Trump administration would even want a solution. <laughs> I would like to hire well, someone for it because it's hard enough. I'll let, you, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, I know. Um, do you, so um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different random things to talk about. I, I guess um, you, you made a statement about the, the making a peace agreement with the Taliban in Afghanistan. So on its face level, that sounds absolutely horrible. But what what other way forward is there in Afghanistan right now for foreign presence there? Because it seems like right now, if we leave, yeah. the Taliban would roll over the rest of the country ba basically the day after. Um, and then uh, we've been uh, there for so long. Like, yeah, what's what's the path forward there that doesn't involve a deal brokered with the Taliban? Yeah, I, I don't know that there is one. You're absolutely right. The you know the Afghan government has no way of defending itself against the Taliban. And, and by the way, there's also an Islamic State affiliate called ISIS and Khorasan, which is equally as deadly as, as the Taliban mm -hmm. in that country. So when we leave, it's going to be a shit show. And but it's a shit show now, I would argue. So is it any worse than a shit show? I don't know. That's, that's that's an academic question. To me, what you want to be doing is is trying your best to basically outfit and equip the Afghan national army, the Afghan government, give them the resources and training that, so they can kind of handle their own problem. And being an old guy that did security intelligence for 30 years, I'm a big believer in sharing intelligence and sharing information to help them identify the bad guys so that they can take them out rather than us taking them out. Because again, if, at least if they take them out, they can claim, look at, you know, we're just like you. We're trying to stop crimes from happening and terrorist acts and killing from happening. Mm -hmm. At least it's Afghans killing Afghans versus rather than Americans or Canadians killing Afghans. And then again, they can say, well, it's all the foreigners fault. You guys came in here, you're killing us. You don't belong here. We're going to kill you in return. So it's not a great answer, and I apologize for that, but I'm not sure there is a great answer for what's happening in Afghanistan. And, and I think you can say the same thing for Iraq. Mm -hmm. If we leave Iraq tomorrow, uh, it's going to be probably a shit show for a very long time. But will it be our shit show? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like in both Afghanistan and Iraq, we, we tried to help them build their military up but for whatever reason it was like there was so much misallocation of funds there was yeah. you know the stories of the ghost soldiers on the payrolls where yeah. commanders were just collecting a lot of money that yeah and it seemed like um yeah i don't know i don't know what the problem is either um if it's just well, like yeah, you know, well, leadership or not mission direction or what well with all due respect to the military and i, I never served in my for my country's armed forces but i have a lot of friends in the military and I, I have a lot of time for them but you know the old saying that you know no plan survives the first engagement with the enemy right mm -hmm. um a lot of this stuff was planned maybe it and, and it thought it would look good, but for reasons you cited, whether it's mismanagement or corruption or whatever, mm -hmm. it, it rarely it rarely pans out the way you think it's going to. So this is why I don't like the term war on terrorism. Yeah. Because it, it's a military, you know, if we're putting in a military analogy, it's, it's like a war on poverty. How are we doing with the war on poverty? How are we doing with the war on drugs? How are we doing with the war on whatever? So again, my bias is very clear. Being an old security intelligence guy, to me, that what you want to do is you want to beef up your security intelligence forces. So like CSIS in my country, the FBI, et cetera, et cetera, the CIA, they're going to identify the bad people, get get rid of them and get out, get out of Dodge before anybody notices you're there. Like, the, like again, the Bin Laden assassination was perfect. They found him, they went in, they took him out, they left. No muss, no fuss, no footprint. There's nothing left for, left for the bad guys to target because you're not there anymore. Whereas if your boots on the ground, there's lots of people to target with IEDs and attacks and suicide bombers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's going to be long-term repercussions um, with our relationship with Iraq after that? I know that they threatened something, or, or I think Trump said that he was going to tariff them if they like didn't. Um, what does it, <laughs> sorry, the, does it, doesn't Trump tariff everybody? Yeah, well, or not? Maybe it wasn't tariff. Maybe I think Trump even didn't. He, weren't the idea of sanctions floated if they yeah. um, if they weren't loyal to us or something anymore? Yeah. Um, 
Well, and maybe that's important for Iraq. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure. The, the Iraqis can deal a lot with their neighboring partners. You talk a lot about Iran. Iran's got huge influence in the region, and that's both for historical and political reasons. Mm -hmm. They're neighbors. Yeah, they fought a brutal civil war yeah. in the 19 sorry, sorry, World War in the 1980s, kind of like World War One with trench warfare and human waves and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they're there. I mean, and, you know, and, and when we leave, and it's a matter of when, not if, right? We're going to leave one day. Iran's still going to be there. And it's going to have its own vested interests in the region. So the question becomes, can we live with that? I think the answer is yes. Uh, it's not going to be easy. But I think that, you know, we have to give into sort of political and geographical realities. Is that unless we, you know, engage plate tectonics tomorrow mm -hmm. and move North America 7 billion kilometers east, we're not going to get anywhere near that area. So how much influence can we, can we have in the long run? Is Iraq going to be a problem? Absolutely. Do they have to get their shit together? Absolutely. Is that going to happen tomorrow? Absolutely not. But... Is that really our problem? I don't know. Do we, we again? We can help the Iraqis with training right. and all kinds of other things, but is it our call to create the government that we want, as opposed to the government that the Iraqis, for right or for wrong, want for themselves? Well, we kind of already did that when, when we took apart their last government and yeah, told them how to do the new <laughs> one. That didn't end very well, did it? Yeah. yeah. It feels like um, it feels like from a U.S. interest. Um, j um, sorry, just to be clear, when I have these conversations, I'm not speaking like morally if it's right or wrong. I'm just from like a, from what the U.S. wants or whatever. It is. From, right. from, a, from a U.S. foreign policy interest, it seems to me that it would be unacceptable that you would have that geographical firewall of Syria, Iraq, and Iran connected in close partnership, especially after we just spent, you know, 15 yeah. years worth of manpower trying to bring Iraq back to a normal U.S. relation, that to just leave and cede that immediately to, to that yeah. firewall of three countries would be devastating to us. I don't disagree with you, but again, it's um, this is all a question of when, right? Because yeah. it, it is going to happen at some point. We seem to be doing that in Afghanistan. I mean, Canada pulled out in 2011, I believe, our last combat forces. You guys are still there. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to pull out of Afghanistan, and the Taliban is going to take over. So, what do we? What can we put in place, or leave in place, or or lend the Afghans to, to make the the transition as as good as possible from our interest perspective, mm -hmm. without meaning we're going to stay there for another 20 years because staying isn't solving it. Like I said, yeah. we're damned if we do, and we're damned if we don't. So, you know, a Syria, Iraq, Iran. Nexus, I, I would argue it's been there already since the 80s. I mean, we've been dealing with it. Um, and to date, we've kind of dealt with it okay. There's been skirmishes here and there, you know, the odd terrorist attack, that kind of thing. But, you know, we haven't seen massive support for terrorism in our homelands from that triumvirate of countries. Mm -hmm. In the same way as we've seen ISIS-inspired, Al-Qaeda-inspired, all that kind of stuff in your country, in my country, through Western Europe kind of thing. So, again, that's, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of bringing this down to sort of the terrorist part. Yeah. That's where, that's where the priority lies. It's, it's with, you know, ISIS isn't dead. They're still around. Mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda is on the, is resurgent. Al-Shabaab's carrying out attacks weekly in Somalia. Boko Haram in Nigeria weekly, which can have repercussions back for us here in the West as well. So that's where I think we need to, you know, if we're going to deploy, that's where we have to deploy. Well, I, I'm really curious about that. So... <clears throat> It seems like you take a big focus on terrorism. It feels to mm -hmm. me like terrorism is definitely like the loud issue. Like that's like the yeah. big thing that we talk about. Yeah. Um, but it feels like from a from like a foreign policy interest yeah. po perspective, the U.S. doesn't actually prioritize terrorism, no. but rather we're more interested in like the geopolitics of mm -hmm. who is friends with who in the Middle East. So, for instance, when you say like a united um, a united Iran, Iraq, and Syria isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. It might not foster terrorism. They might be able to like hold off terrorists even better, right? ISIS wouldn't be able to grow if those three countries are unified. Um, but people like Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, you know, mm -hmm. Israel, um, that has to deal with Hezbollah and everything, they probably, the, our allies down there wouldn't be very thrilled no. geopolitically with those three countries coming together and like being strong allies and being able to transport troops back and forth, right? right? Like Soleimani, for instance, was was um, pivotal in helping Syria fight off ISIS in that country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, you, you raise a really good point. And I, mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. And even I, as a, as a terrorism guy, even I know that terrorism is really a blip when it comes yeah. to international security. I mean, yeah, we have to worry about it. Do we want to stop attacks? Absolutely. Do we want to stop innocents from dying? Absolutely. But in the grand scale of things, it really is. It's, I wouldn't call it a rounding error, but it's pretty minimal when you look at the bigger picture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So but even, even geopolitically, um, there have to be better ways to get around this. So, you know, I mean, you know, at Winston Churchill <laughs> famously said, jaw jaw is always better than war war. So, I mean, are we even engaged at the diplomatic level as, as hard as that might be? I mean, are we, you know, are there backroom channels going on right now to have these kinds of talks where we can have a civil discussion where we can say, okay, how is this going to go forward? What are you going to do? What are we going to do? What, what can we accept? What is something that you're okay with and we're okay with? I, I'm sure those channels are going on. I don't have access to them because I'm retired right now. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's a much better calculus going forward 
in saying, well, we're going to be in the area indefinitely to, to protect our Israeli friends and our Saudi friends, et cetera, et cetera, because that's not sustainable. Yeah. Okay, what is it costing? What is it costing the U.S. taxpayer to have this permanent deployment in the Middle East? It's got to be costing like trillions of dollars over the past couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and what's it gotten us? Well, I don't know what it's gotten us. Um, not, I don't think it's gotten us a lot. Yeah. Um, speaking of diplomatic uh, channels, uh, did you have a strong opinion on the Iranian nuclear deal, the joint pack of whatever? I'm going to be really careful because I'm certainly not a nuclear expert and I rely on people that I have a lot of respect for. And the ones that I did read mm -hmm. uh, and followed did say it was the best deal possible under the circumstances. Was it perfect? No. Mm -hmm. But the Iranians were kind of uh, ponying up to the bar. They were uh, abiding by the, the uh, restrictions and principles. So I think it was the best thing we could have done. I did. I did not just agree rather with the Trump administration when they when they tore it up. It was a day to the administration kind of thing. I think that was just a, a knee jerk reaction. And Wait, I you to say that you did or didn't disagree. I sorry. I, I disagreed with the Trump. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, gotcha, yeah. I, I thought everyone of the Europeans, everybody was saying it's working so far uh, mm -hmm. as well as it can. So I you know, inspectors were in place. It was being monitored kind of thing. I mean, I kind of hate to say this. I might get some hate mail for saying this, but to me, a lot of U.S. action towards Iran is like we're still stuck in 79. Yeah. We're still stuck with the hostage crisis. We're still stuck with the humiliation of having diplomats held for 444 days. You know, the, you know and, and the impact it had on the Carter administration, and it probably helped Reagan get Reagan elected. Reagan came in and they released him, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, can, can, it, it was terrible. And, and, you know, that was just four started by current intelligence with the Canadian government. But can we not put that behind us? My God, we've all had, you know, incidents in the past that, you know, we didn't like. But, you know... You, do we have to keep harping on that kind of thing? So I think there's room for dialogue. I think the Obama administration was kind of getting there. Whether they'll get there under the Trump administration, I'm not really confident in that respect right now. So no, I did not think that the uh, the uh, abandoning of the nuclear treaty with the Iranians was a good idea because every indication was that it was working exactly as it was planned. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a principal failure in, in Middle Eastern foreign policy. I don't see any gains from it whatsoever, other than being antagonistic towards Iran, which I don't know why... You... <laughs> I to one yeah. Um, do you, so, <clears throat> one of the problems that I have with executive action. So, our president is capable of doing some things unilaterally, yes. but something that a president can assert unilaterally can be removed by the next president unilaterally. So, mm -hmm. like the Iran nuclear deal, do, is there a way forward for the U.S. to even negotiate with countries like Iran? Like, it, it, like it feels like a lot of the credibility has been lost when, like, hopefully, you know, the next president doesn't just completely undo this, like. <laughs> Well, I guess we're gonna have to see what happens with your election this November, right? I mean, right now it's looking like a, a pretty even vote from yeah. what I gather. Watching it, it's kind of 50-50 about who's gonna, whether Trump will get a second term or whether Democrats will take it. Mm -hmm. I think if the Democrats do win, you're gonna see a significant shift in U.S. foreign policy. If nothing else, then to be seen as to be undoing the Trump years. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've got a two-party state down there, right? Where one seems to want to undo whatever the last ones did just because they can yeah. and because that's what their base wants. So I, I think there's a way forward. I think Iran is open to negotiation. I really do believe that. Um, you know, Iran's under a lot of pressure right now from their own people. Uh, yeah, people before are, we get uh, too far into how willing Iran is uh, willing to work with the U.S., like apparently within the past few hours, I think it's been reported that rockets have hit a U.S. embassy in Baghdad. So <laughs> uh, I, I read that as well. Yeah, I think yeah. those are fired from either Iraqi militias or Iraqi. I, I saw that in Al Jazeera. I don't know what the details are right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it ends up being, if they make a tidy Iran, either real or suspected, then we're going to have more retaliation. I mean, where does this thing go? It becomes like a like a tit for tat, right? And, and it's like, you hit me, I hit you. And I, I just don't know at the end of the day, what, how any of this benefits any of us in terms of, you know, regional relations and, and the future of geopolitics in the Middle East. No. Yeah. So anyway, so going back to Iran, yeah, I, I mean, the Iranian people are, they're, they're fed up, they're pissed. I mean, it's been 40 years, uh, you know, the economy's in the tank, in part because of sanctions, in part because the Iranian military, you know, sucks out a lot of the Iranian budget from, you know, mm -hmm. and so the country's not been doing well for a very long time. People are fed up of the theocracy. Like I studied Iran for 20 years as a, as a, as a intelligence analyst, and I know that these people, they, they want anything but what they've got right now. But unfortunately, you know, the theocrats in power, the IRGC is in power, and they, they, they hold the levers of power. So they can, you know, hit their own protesters and kill them and slaughter them at yeah. almost at will. But My understanding I mean, is that is this... for decent reason, too, um, like Iranians, at least older generation Iranians, are not very happy with, like, the West. Like, it's not like they would welcome, like, America with open no. arms to come in and, like, fix anything as well, right? No, they wouldn't. But I think there there, there have been relations with the Europeans for the long. I mean, most countries in Europe still have diplomatic relations with Iran. We did until like 2014, I think, or 2015. We we closed our embassy for for 
you know, a variety of reasons. So there are people in the West that will talk to the Iranians. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, to me, Stephen, to me, the, the big the big loss that we did was way back in the late 90s when Mohammad Khatami became president. He was a moderate. He would talk to us. And yet, uh, you know, the second Bush presidency came out with the axis of evil speech right after 9-11. Oh, yeah. And it labeled Iran as the axis of evil. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? That was a lost opportunity because we had an opening. Yeah, and I remember Iran, reading. It, I, I wish I could remember the ambassador, but he was talking about, I think it was one of the people that was actually even in talks with Soleimani, not directly, but always through somebody else that was saying that we were really close to forging some sort of like makeshift alliance or pact or whatever. Yep. And then Bush came out with that speech and completely undermined like all of the progress that we'd made towards normalizing relations with Iran. Yeah. Which makes you wonder again why it was said, especially after 9 11, when neither Iraq nor Iran nor North Korea had nothing to do with 9 11. Yeah. These are Sunni, Sunnism as extremists. And so, in, anyway, it was an unfortunate remark by the president, but it, it set back any possibility of an opening. So, I think the opening, I, I think most Iranians, and I know a lot of Iranian Canadians, are, are, are just chopping at the bit for good relations with the West. Are some of the older ones against it? Yeah, because they lived under the Shah. Mm -hmm. And the Shah was a Western stooge who basically, you know, killed his own people. But they're fed up with the theocracy. They're fed up, fed up with the military, and they they want to become a you know a, a a first world nation. And I think that we owe it to ourselves to explore the possibility of a dialogue. Is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. We have a lot of things we have to talk about with the Iranians. But again, as Churchill said, talking is better than fighting. At the, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um. Man, I actually hate talking about U.S. foreign policy because it seems like one of the most hopeless arenas. <laughs> um. <laughs> I guess it's, I imagine it must be the same in Canada. Um, the, the two biggest problems I have with foreign policy is that one, um, well, three, I guess. One is that it's very complicated, obviously, because mm -hmm. you've got multiple interests competing at any point in time. We talk about wanting peace with Iran. Saudi Arabia might not be too happy with that. Yeah. Um, and then two, we, we lie. The U.S. lies all the time about why we're in regions. Like, we don't really care about freeing people or whatever. Any of that is all bullshit, right? It's, it's just making sure that we've, like, secured our foreign interests. And then three, um, it seems like people in general don't actually really care about foreign policy. And I don't even know if I blame them necessarily. That when you rank things like the economy, healthcare, yeah. immigration, these are things that are so much more pressing than countries that most people, 95%, probably couldn't point out on a map, you know? Um, yeah. So it's I, think, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, I haven't been following the Democratic you know, Leadership Convention in your country very closely, but mm -hmm. how often is foreign policy on the agenda? I'm the only never. time it comes up is when we talk about, like, should we kill ISIS? It will be, like, yeah. the only foreign policy question. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and I know in our last election, um, you know, uh, that just took place last October, there was no foreign policy debate. No one cared. Like yeah. you said, the average Canadian-American couldn't give a rat's ass about foreign policy. It just isn't. It's not as important as your next paycheck and how you can pay the bills and can you afford your kids' education. Mm -hmm. That's what, what And it is complicated. And, you know, and I think the other thing we've done wrong, both our countries, is that the foreign policy professionals, the people that really get this kind of stuff, are not the ones making the decisions. Yeah, it right? seems to be very, very, very political. I guess it's yeah. the same with economic policy, too. It's always really painful to listen to, like, you know, here's what all the economic advisors say, yeah. but here's yeah. what the political partisans, like, in Washington will, will end up saying. Yeah, I, you yeah. Know, and you get these appointments as ambassadors in both our countries where people are probably not the best people to send abroad because they're not experts in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, they have their minions and they have their advisors and their consultants, absolutely, but when the guy at the top doesn't really get it, I mean, is that the best person you want representing yourself, your country yeah. abroad? Not what if you put him on the spot, right? Yeah. And it, it, can't, it can't come up with an answer. So you know, that's why foreign policy, most people, you know, run, run away from like, like, like the plague or like the new coronavirus or whatever, because they don't get it. It doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. I always said I would pay a lot of money to like be able to sit in an audience and listen to Trump talk about like Middle Eastern foreign policy for just two hours. It would be so funny. Like I, I like I would bet thousands of dollars that he didn't even know who Soleimani was until the option was presented to him at the briefing to actually take him out. <laughs> like I'm pretty sure he might have heard his name once or twice in a briefing, but I seriously doubt he had any fucking idea. Um, just just well, listening and, to him talk, like. Uh, and I, and I had heard that you know the options were present, presented to the president, and and they didn't think he was going to pick the most drastic, which you know take this guy out. Mm -hmm. And I think they were like, were absolutely like they thought, oh my god, he did what we didn't think he was going to do. And you know, in hindsight, maybe we shouldn't put that option at the, at the top of the page. We should have stopped at three instead of putting the fourth option up there mm -hmm. because he picked it. And of course, they had no choice not to carry it out, right? And then we're again we're stuck in the situation we are right now. So yeah, yeah. Foreign policy is tough. There's no question about it. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um. Man, I feel like we're, it sounds like we're probably going to agree on most things. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Wait, come on. We got to disagree on something. Come on. Throw something out there, please. <laughs> um, oh, man. So so I, your, I think your opinion is roughly congruent to mine that, like, I, I disagree with all the people characterize. Like, um, I don't know, like, how engaged you are with, like, politics that either exist online. I, like, I've heard a lot of people that tilt pretty far left 
you know, say things like mm-hmm. Soleimani was there for peace talks. He was a good guy. I like how you're right. Yeah. I, yeah. So I agree with you. Like no love lost. Like if he's dead, that's fine. Doing it the way we did it. Um, escalating tensions in the region, probably not a good idea. Doing it on Iraqi soil, probably not a good idea without their, you know, cooperation. Um, well, the problem, you see, the problem with taking out somebody like that, and he was a member of a government. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. taking out bin Laden, taking out oh, Baghdad, these are terrorists. No one's going to shed a tear, and there's no state behind them, right? There's no one that's going to say, oh, boy, we're going to launch something back. Mm-hmm. You're talking a state, it's a different thing. And the problem is when you carry out these extrajudicial assassinations sort of unilaterally, you're kind of saying... It's okay to do this. So what happens when the North Koreans next, next take out some diplomat in Thailand? Yeah. Or the Chinese get really pissed off at what's happening in Hong Kong or Taiwan or whatever mm-hmm. and decide to whack somebody. I guess it's okay then, right? Well, because to be, we so to, to hit on an extreme technicality. So I think the two justifications given are that one, um, I think the Trump administration did declare the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a um, terrorist organization. Sure. Correct, yes. So technically, they did have that designation, even though they, it is a part of a state, a union, yeah. Um, and then the second one was that, I think the argument was given was that the authorization for the use of military force in Iraq gave Trump the authority to target and kill Soleimani. That would be my guess with the U.S. justification for saying, like, well, this is okay. They were terrorists. We killed a terrorist. Like, sure, it might have been Iran, but, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, that 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 does that did some justification, but, you know, mm-hmm. The one that was given at first was that, it, you know, he posed a clear and present danger to the U.S. interests in the region. Yeah. And everything I'm seeing is that was not true, is that, you know, there were no planned attacks against U.S. embassies in the, sure. in the Middle East, in the Gulf region. So, again, is it was I guess the problem I'm having, Stephen, is that was this really carefully thought out? And I, I don't think the answer is yes. I think this was a, a, a gut decision that was taken. Mm-hmm. And now we're kind of trying to explain it post facto. Yeah. Like, OK, you know. What was really happening at the time? Oh, what we really meant to say was this, this, and this. And and, that, and that's where I think we run into the problems. And you see, when, when you make decisions like this, which are really important decisions, you got to be thinking ahead. Okay, what's what are the implications going to be? What is the likely Iranian response? What is the likely Syrian response? What's mm-hmm. the likely Iraqi response? What's the likely Russian response? This mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I'm not sure those calculations were made because I'm not sure that people at the time cared. And that's where you want your, your veteran mm-hmm. foreign policy and security experts in the room saying, but sir... Okay, if we do this, let's look at the, con- the possible consequences down the road. I'm not sure that happened. Yeah, and it's hard to believe that when uh, when I'm pretty sure both Bush and Obama had their thumbs uh, on Soleimani, and that was back when he was actively involved in killing U.S. troops in Iraq, and we yeah. still decided not to take him out. Um, yeah. It's it's hard to think that the, that that calculation would have changed so much now when things are relatively quiet compared to where they used to be. Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And so and so, you know, but we, you know, we can question this thing until the end of time, and yeah. there'll be people. And I've seen, maybe in you know, twenty years, uh, freedom of information, yeah, yeah. 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 And you know, people are on, people are for it, people are against. It. I've read op eds on, on both sides of the issue, but I think to me, going back to my earlier point, is that this really wasn't where we need to be focusing our efforts, whether it's geopolitically or from a national international security perspective. This was kind of a sideshow. Yes, yes, they were a nasty actor. Yes, they're still a nasty actor. Yes, they will be a nasty act, a nasty actor for the time, time going forward. But to me, it's just that there are other priorities out there, and I kind of just ask myself, was this really that important to do this right now mm-hmm. when we got so many other irons in the fire? And my conclusion is that it probably wasn't. Um, so I'm kind of curious. We're dealing with more past events than than forward. But like, what do you think the U.S. involvement should have been in Syria? Let's assume. Do you do you believe that, for instance, do you believe that Assad used chemical weapons against his people, or do you think that that's a conspiratorial claim? I have no reason to, to doubt that he did it, given okay. the kind of man he is and the kind of regime that he he backs. Uh, I have, I, yeah, I have no doubt that he actually used those. And you know, and this is the problem, right? Mm-hmm. Is that we kind of needed Syria to whack ISIS because ISIS was they, they were mean sons of bitches. I mean, they were the most heinous group I've ever dealt with in all, all of my time. Mm-hmm. These were bastards, right? They raped little girls. They threw people off buildings. They burned people alive. They drowned people. I mean, these, you know, they, these guys make, I mean, I'll kind of look like, a, like, like, like the Boy Scouts. Sure. I mean, these guys are really nasty bunch. And the fact is, is that ISIS, you know, was primarily located in Syria and Iraq. Mm-hmm. So we had to rely on the locals, i.e. the Iraqis and the Syrians to help us. The problem is, is that the Syrians are the Assad government. And you really want to be dealing with those guys. But, you know, sometimes you, you look at what is in our, in our mutual interests and, and, and whose help do I really need? And you got to kind of like, like swallow this one, right? Like, I really hate Assad and I really hate his regime. But in this instance, I kind of got to work with him. I can hold my nose and do it because the, the, the greater end is there and, and the greater advantage is there. 
And I think it's what we did. We all collectively did. And Wait, we, it, it felt like the U.S. interest was more helping the uh, like the FSA and those elite uh, aligned groups that we were more interested in a destabilization. This is one of my big problems with like U.S. foreign policy is that like I- ISIS seemed like it could have been dealt with like relatively easily if there was like a united yeah. Western front against them. Yeah. But that in the West, we were actually more interested in ISIS controlling those oil fields. Like our ally Turkey, you know, got a bunch of cheap oil from those trucks running back and forth in those oil fields. And then Assad was feeling a lot of pressure from not only the moderate rebels that were in that, you know, in the, in the northwest, western part of Syria, but also ISIS being there as well, that it seemed like we were kind of supporting that um, that destabilization, I guess, is what it felt like. Yeah, and then, but yeah, it could complicate, right? Because because Iran is there. Iran is a close Syrian ally, and of course, then Russia came in as well. Russia is a close Syrian mm-hmm. ally. So the problem is there were too many cooks in the kitchen, mm-hmm. and and they, we all have very d- different interests, at yeah. very different levels, and we're not friends. You know, Russia's not our friend. Uh, Syria's not our friend. Iran's not our friend. Yet all of us had were collectively against it, ISIS. They were, they were they were those guys you want to hit. So you know, and depending on what what horse you backed in which race, you got different results. So mm-hmm. I, I just again back to our, for our our previous agreement, right? It's that foreign policy is really, really hard. And and you know, you, you kind of make it up on the fly sometimes. But yeah, when it comes to ISIS, I think we should have said, okay, our goal is to get rid of ISIS. And we're not looking at, Sy- at, at regime change in Syria, Arab Spring notwithstanding, it ain't going to happen anytime soon. Not that I don't wish the best for the Syrian people. I, I wish they could get rid of the guy. Mm-hmm. But it's not going to happen tomorrow, especially with Russian backing. But our, our goal should have been to get rid of Islamic State because those people were just the most disgusting terrorists I've ever seen. And and then, you know, and then down the road, we'll go, we'll revisit the question. OK, what do we do about Syria? What do we do about Iran? What do we do about the region? Yeah. Um, let's see. So going forward, um, going forward in the region, I, I'm not sure what Iraq's future is going to look like in terms of our relationship with the United States. Um, what our, our our relationship with Iran is it seems like it's completely destroyed. Like um, for now, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even more than it was with us just bailing well, on. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I think I think with Iraq, I mean, look, like they've asked us to leave. Mm-hmm. Right, the parliament a non-binding resolution said they want us to leave. There are demonstrations in the streets. Yes, probably sponsored by Iran mm-hmm. to get the hell out of Dodge. We don't want you guys here anymore. We're gonna withdraw eventually anyway because we always do, right? Because we have no choice. You can't stay. Look at, like I said, Afghanistan. We were there for two decades in Afghanistan. Yeah. And we're and we're actually thinking about getting out because it's costing us billions of dollars. We're losing lives. It's not working. All that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, going forward, will Iran have influence in Iraq? Absolutely. I mean, Iraq Iraq is is is, is two thirds Shia, just like Iran. So there's a religious affinity between the two countries. Yeah, they fought the war in the 80s, but for the most part, Iran has its tentacles in a lot of levels of the Iraqi government, including the parliament, including the presidency. Um, you know, they're the Kurds. What, what do we do with the Kurds? I mean, do we help them? Because they're kind of more like us. Can I even use that term? Mm-hmm. But I, I think we're going forward. We're going to have to let the Iraqis figure it out for themselves uh, and, and and stop invading them because it didn't work well. And, and you know, it, well, maybe the Kuwait thing was easy because, we, we again, we went in, we got out, you know, Saddam Hussein withdrew, blah, 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 end of story. Mm-hmm. But that, that led to instability in the 90s. And then, we you know, we went in 2003 uh, again. And we've been there for... 16 17 years now almost yeah and it's not going well i don't see why it's going to get any better if we stay so i i guess you know you kind of try to minimize the effect of, of leaving in terms of will it actually affect your allies and then more importantly your homeland because again going back to our previous statement all our citizens care about is the homeland yeah they really couldn't care less of what happens in saudi arabia or syria or kuwait or whatever is is it am i going to you know walk down the street in new york or california or, or toronto or whatever and am I going to be afraid of a terrorist attack that's been sponsored by a terrorist group living in Iraq or Iran? Mm-hmm. That's what they care about, uh, you know. And as governments, we have to care about more. But you know, if we want it, if we want the support of our citizenry, we keep them safe first. Foreign policy is just an add-on. It's a, it's, it's an afterthought. Yeah. Do you think that like going forward, it seems really hard because a lot of these like foreign policy decisions that we take are like long-term strategies. Like there's not like a big thing you can do in the Middle East in one day that all of these things require like some long-term commitment. But it seems like at least in the U.S., our two political parties are right now appear to be pretty diametrically opposed to like solutions Mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, I don't know. Uh, Yeah, it just, it seems really hopeless. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I wonder how, what is the, how, how do you withstand how do you even have a clear foreign policy direction going forward when every four to eight years your, your direction yeah. can just switch so dramatically? Well, and maybe we have to get to a point where it doesn't really matter. I mean, okay, when mm-hmm. did the Middle East when did the Middle East start mattering to us? 
Um, pretty well in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Yeah, the during the Cold War era and yeah, maybe earlier we than that. Them, sure. right? yeah. Do we do we really need them right now? And I'm not being flippant here. I'm not trying to you know abandon former allies or current allies. Uh-huh. I, I would say we... that it seems like we do. That's what it feels like to me because we are. Why? I'm curious why we say that. <clears throat> so the it it feels like we still have kind of like a NATO expansionist mindset in, in terms of how we deal with Russia, and it seems like Russia's mm-hmm. access to the Middle East is somewhat important to us. And then Which we have, stop, yeah. yeah, and then we have allies in the Middle East, like the Gulf states, so Saudi Arabia, yeah. and then Israel, that it are opposed by those interests in the region. So for instance, I know that Israel would be very sad to see that that Shia coalition of countries form where Hezbollah in Lebanon and, and, and Hamas in Palestine are going to be like bigger and bigger problems for them if those regions get strengthened. It seems like that would be the case. But do you really think the Israelis can't take care of themselves? First of all, they're very good at what they do. Their mm-hmm. intelligence service, their military, are very good at what they do. Second of all, you know, both our nations are strong allies of Israel and we will come to their assistance where required. So, my, okay, but my, going back to the earlier point, do we really need to be there physically on the ground to maintain those alliances to help our friends when they need to be helped? You know, uh, the Saudis are spending gazillions of dollars on weapons to, to defend themselves. Are they capable? Probably not. That's a, that's a whole other issue. But I think there's many things we can do to support our allies in the region, which does not involve the permanent presence of tens of thousands, about hundreds of thousands of troops. Yeah, I which, think again, definitely agree with that. More, yeah. 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 If, if you yeah, if you mean like, do we need to be there in terms of that? Yeah, probably not. That the, the limited operations of special forces troops and then like training yeah. local troops is probably yeah. like a better involvement because that leads to more long term stability than an indefinite occupation. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, the, the best thing we can do is leave people who are better trained, better equipped and get it. Mm-hmm. as opposed to us providing their, you know, defending their territory on their behalf. Mm-hmm. And if we do that, then we both won. You've got a stronger ally, and we're not spending the money to uh, keep our men and women over there in uniform. Sure. Do you, um, I guess because we kind of talked about Israel for a second, um, how do we fix Israel and Palestine? <laughs> well, do you, oh, oh, what do you, so what do you think about like the annexation of the West Bank or, or I guess like broadly speaking, what's like a path forward for Israel that represents well, most people's interests? Is that... Wow, I'm gonna be, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, well, first of all, I was against the annexation of the West Bank. I mm-hmm. think that was a mistake. I think that uh, again, it sends the wrong message. It sends that force force wins out, and that this, you know the Palestinians do not have the the right to 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 their own state. Are the Palestinians doing the right thing? No, because you know, as someone once said, it might have been Golda Meir, I forget, who said, you know, the Palestinians never miss a chance to miss a chance, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which seems to be so true about the way they've done things. But I, I think that, you know, the current Netanyahu government is, is making a lot of decisions that I don't particularly support. You know, he keeps raising this security thing. And yeah, Israel's surrounded by some pretty nasty neighbors. But at the same time, none of these neighbors actually, you know, threaten the existence of Israel. I mean, Israel's far too strong to be threatened by, by any of these you know, various actors in the region. Mm-hmm. Could it get worse? Absolutely, it could, 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 could get worse. But nothing that I see suggests to me that Israel is on the, on the precipice of, of, of you know, of, of being destroyed kind of thing. And they have had relations, you know, very good relations with Jordan that go back many, many decades. At one point, they kind of got along with Lebanon, um, Hezbollah notwithstanding. They got along with Egypt for the most part. So it's not that diplomacy can't work in the region. And it seems to me that the Netanyahu government is doing things that that are simply counterproductive. I think the annexation is one thing. Um, I think the pandering to the ultra-Orthodox extremist Jewish community is another thing, where they're basically letting a very, very small part of the population dictate their, their foreign and domestic policy. I mean, to me... Those people are every bit as extremist as the people that worry about we were about in Iran and Iraq and places like that. Mm-hmm. And the government seems to be kowtowing to their demands. So I, I think that, you know, I'm not going to dictate the Israelis how to carry out their foreign and domestic policy. But I just think that there's a lot of times where they do things that really aren't helpful in the long run. And I think they could they could have a much better diplomatic front. I think that they could talk to their neighbors. And that, again, that's to me going forward. That's the best best thing. Have your military, have your security forces ready. On, on, a, on a hair trigger if need be, but you, you, you adopt the diplomatic route first and see how far it's going to get you. Um, so this probably goes without saying, but I'm guessing that you're probably opposed to Trump recognizing like that Jerusalem is the capital of um, Israel. We're going to move the embassy there and all that. Was that probably not a good decision or do you, would you, were you okay with that? Or? Well, well, frankly, I don't care. I mean, mm-hmm. to me, I mean, it, I think what would have been the best is that, I mean, if Israel wants to move the capital to West Jerusalem, I mean, fill your boots. It's their it's their right as as Israelis. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jerusalem is a very important part for Jews, as we all know. The fact that they annexed most of East Jerusalem 
gives me a problem because East Jerusalem is technically in Palestinian territory mm -hmm. and the Palestinians want that as their capital. So they basically said, well, kind of screw you. You can't have it kind of thing. But whether it's Tel Aviv or whether it's it's Jerusalem or whether it's God, who cares what, they have every right to do so. But to me, what by annexing the West Bank and by cutting off East Jerusalem from the Palestinians, that's a step too far. And that just leads to more violence down the road. Because again, you've told them that, you know what, we don't care what you think. We're going to take it anyway. So what's the response the Palestinians have? Well, it's violence. Yeah. Groups like Hamas, you know, allies like Hezbollah, groups like Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I mean, you've basically said uh, to them, we're not going to negotiate. We're not going to sit around the table and talk. We're just going to do this. And so you've basically taken out every other, every other weapon from the, the Palestinian arsenal and said, violence is the only way that's going to work. So that's why they keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was my understanding of like, like whether the capitals in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or whatever is not important. It was just more like the symbolic, you know, yeah. basically thumbs up to everything Israel is doing insofar as their treatment of the Palestinians seemed like about no, no, and, and as long as it's West Jerusalem, I think no one had a problem with that. But, you know, Jerusalem is a divided city in the same way Berlin was during the Cold War. We had a West Berlin, we had East Berlin, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's not, it's not an ideal situation. And, you know, the Palestinians, Israelis don't get along for the most part, but there could have been some kind of modicum of understanding where they say, okay, we're going to share this city and we'll, you know, granted we'll have certain powers and we'll have certain things in place and we'll see if we can get along and see where it goes. But no, I mean, that, that option is off the table right now. And I don't think, I don't think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. Where do we go from here? What, what else can we solve? Well, what, okay. So what is your right now? What do you think is, um, man, so I, I guess actually, so one of my things, if I'm like being completely blunt, um, we kind of hit it on this earlier. I don't think um, terrorism seems more like a PR thing than like an actual like mm -hmm. destructive, you know, like this is having a huge impact on and on anything. Um, it, like, cause it's like the death tolls and everything from, from terrorists in Western countries compared to anything else pales in comparison, basically. But it, it's a huge yeah. driving force of like public sentiment towards different yeah. foreign policy decisions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you think are some like big threats moving forward in the future that the West should like be looking out for in terms of terrorism around the world? Okay, well, that's a great question. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. So, you know, working counterterrorism for 15 years, I've written five books on terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I understand terrorism and and yet when you compare the number of deaths in our countries, both yours and mine, from terrorism over the past, I don't know, 10 years, compared to gun deaths or bathtub drowning deaths or whatever, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it is a blip. It's a statistical error sure. for the most part. And yet we spend a gazillion dollars on it because, you know, all, one terrorist attack is one too many, right? We had an attack here in, in Ottawa back in 2014 where the, where the gunman got as far as the center block of our parliament. He was like a few oh. years away from, from the prime minister. Yeah, and you had right? the older dude that took him out or whatever, right? I think I remember yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, It scared the shit out of people because it was, you know, this is the center of government. And the guy got that close. Now, he was dead within seconds of, you know, getting into the front door, but it doesn't matter. Um, it, and so it has a disproportionate effect on people. Mm -hmm. when, it, when you call it terrorism, people get really afraid. So we had a really bizarre incident about a week ago, two weeks ago. Where there was a nuclear alert at one of our power plants, right? Something went wrong, and the alert went out saying, "Don't do anything." But there's been a leak. That's never a good tweet you want to have on a Sunday morning, right? Yeah. And some people said, "Oh my God, it's terrorism! It's terrorism!" Well, no, it's not. It was just somebody fucked up on the on the control panel and sent out the wrong message, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But see, that's 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 the hold that terrorism has on us. It, it it drives fear. It drives panic. It drives you to see things that aren't there. And then for the most part, in both of our countries, in most Western Western European countries, we have a really good handle on terrorism. We have the investigations in place. Very few attacks, you know, succeed. We're not Afghanistan. We're not Somalia, where there are, you know, we've had there are more deaths in Afghanistan on a bad Monday morning than there have been in 250 years of Canadian history from terrorists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Afghanistan, it is an ex existential threat. The Taliban is an existential threat to Afghanistan. Uh, Al Shabaab is a serious threat in Somalia. ISIS was a serious threat in Iraq and Syria. In our countries, is not the case. I think going forward, and a lot of people would agree with me on this. What we, what we need to do is figure out what to do with this rising, I don't know if I call it rising, it's always been there, but, but this perceived increase in, you know, far right, white nationalist, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, call it what you want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are people that um, are really hateful. Um, they're, you know, they don't like a lot of things and they think that using violence is a way to protect their ways of life. But we're seeing, I just read an article where, you know, the German military thinks there's over 500 people in the German military that subscribe to neo-Nazi views in the German military. Here's guys with a lot of pretty serious firepower that mm -hmm. think that Hitler was right. So what do you do with those guys? And you, you in your country, I mean, I could, we could go on for days of the, you know the threat from the various militias. There's arrest just what last week in Virginia. A Canadian was involved in that. There were you know some some militia group that wanted to start the Boogaloo and mm -hmm. you know the downfall of the American Republic kind of thing. Which by the way is bullshit. I mean these guys they talk a lot. They talk big. 
But there's no way that what they're going to do is going to be the cascading effect of overthrowing the U.S. government. These guys, they think far too much of themselves for the most sure. part, which does not mean they can't kill people. They can. So yeah. I think the, big, the biggest problem we're having right now, and I'm pretty sure it's the same in your country, is that we're trying to figure out um, how do we allocate resources to look at this? Mm -hmm. So we've got, you know, we have a security intelligence service. We have a law enforcement. You guys have the FBI. You know, who do we put where and why? So how many, you know, FBI agents are looking at jihadi cells in the States? How many are looking at militias? How many are looking at something I've been warning about? You know, what about the, the, the rise of the far left? Those that are, you know, think that the, the, the climate is changing so rapidly and no one gives a shit about it. And what about if those people start turning violent to send a message? Oh, Who's yeah, I think those people. You had an article written on eco-terrorism. Uh, yeah. I, I actually, I read something else that you wrote, um, and I, and I kind of want to ask you about it now. I'm glad you brought up the white nationalist thing, because um, <clears throat> you, so you've written about whether or not gangs should be considered terrorist organizations, which mm -hmm. you, and you seem opposed to that. Um, but then you bring up the white nationalist people. I'm really curious, how do you, what, what is your definition of terrorism? What, how, what is uh, your designation? Yeah. yeah, this seems to be like, sure. a, we talk about this a lot in the U.S., yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so first of all, like there's hundreds of different, things, right? Mm -hmm. The one that I use, it basically I take right out of the criminal code because that's the one I had to obey when I worked in, in security intelligence. Mm -hmm. So an act of terrorism is a serious act of violence that is perpetrated for political, ideological, or religious reasons. That's all the criminal code has to say on that. It's very, very simple. The challenge is we, we understand serious acts of violence, right? Mm -hmm. You kill somebody, that's pretty serious. The challenge is how are you to determine the motivation behind it? Sure. How do you prove that I, I put a gun to your head and pull the trigger because of some kind of political or ideological motive? And we yeah. had a case here a couple of years ago where a young man walked to a mosque in Quebec City and wasted six people. And uh, he was not charged with terrorism. He was charged with first degree murder. And in fact, he pleaded guilty to first degree murder because the prosecution, what we call the crown here in Canada, couldn't determine whether or not he was truly motivated by some kind of ideology. Probably was. He was on, on various white nationalist sites, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But how do you prove that? How do I prove what I was thinking at the time? Right? Yeah, something that really worries me in the U.S. when we have those same conversations. Um, I, politically, I, I don't know how familiar I am, but politically, I'm very, very left-leaning. Um, but I get a little bit worried sometimes when I'll read a news article where it's like, um, I, I wish I could remember the name. But I, I think there, w there, was a, there was a Trump supporter that killed, mm. I think it was his girlfriend and a couple members of her family when he was out on vacation with them. Maybe someone don't know the exact story, but it was listed like, yeah, this guy was a Trump supporter, MAGA hat wearing, blah, blah, blah. But when you're going through and you like look at like what happened, it doesn't seem like this was politically motivated. Like the dude yeah. had problems. Like, yeah, he like retweeted yeah. some Trump MAGA stuff, but like, was it really like a terrorist thing? Was this guy like yeah. politically motivated? Um, it, not in the same way that like the New Zealand shooter was, for instance, who was right. very clearly politically motivated. Yeah. Well, we had a manifesto, right? You wrote a manifesto yeah. that he told yeah. us exactly why he did it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. making those designations seem, uh, yeah, that seems to be very, very, very challenging, especially it anytime is. any shooting is involved. Um, so like in the U.S., like we have this thing where, you know, if you find out that somebody, you know, tries to blow up a plane, if they're brown, it's terrorism. But if it's yeah. white, you know, it's, it's a yeah. crazy guy, mental problems, yeah, yeah, yeah. blah, 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 yeah. blah. That's not yeah. terrorism. And I think we've even had examples of like there was a guy that tried to set off a nail bomb in an airport a few years ago and he was white. And I don't even know if this made the national news like nobody cared. Yeah. Um, or, yeah. you know, if oh, one of my favorite examples was um, in the United States, um, somewhere in, in the West in some expanse of nowhere land that no one cares about, like a group of white people decided that they were going to take over large swaths of, of like federally controlled land because they disagreed with some like mm -hmm. with some federal policy about like owning the land or whatever. Like if these right. people were brown, this would have been 100 percent terrorist for an occupation of soil. But since it was white people, like nobody really cared that much. Yeah. We didn't even talk yeah. about it for more than a week. Yeah. Well, anyway, right. especially in your country, if you, you do the do the math, mm -hmm. do the numbers over the past since 9-11. Like orders of magnitude, more people are killed by what we would call right, sort of broadly speaking, white nationalist, white supremacists than by brown people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the stats are their kind of thing. You know, I, I just had a thought, Stephen, and I'll share to share it with you. So what if we treated this a little bit differently? So in Canada, um, we have terrorism. It's in the criminal code. Um, we also have something called hate crimes. OK, uh, so hate crimes are, are when you do something violent and it's determined you, you actually directed it against a certain group, mm -hmm. blacks, LGBTQ, women, whatever you want to call it kind of thing. The way the law reads, and this is my understanding of it, is that you try the person for the offense of, what, of which they're guilty, uh, assault, attempted murder, murder, whatever kind of thing. And it was determined that there was hate behind it. And, it, and that's a hard determination to make. Yeah. The judge the judge has the, um, the the leeway to make the sentence longer if it's hate related. Mm -hmm. So let's say you got 10 years for first degree murder. You get 15 because it was a hate crime. What if we did the same thing with terrorism? 
So if you kill somebody, you kill somebody. And whatever your statutes say is the penalty for, for that. And if it's determined, oh, by the way, you had an ISIS flag or you, you know, worshipped an ISIS or you made a video before you did it, mm -hmm. that's a terrorism link. Therefore, instead of getting 25 years, you get 50 years because it's a terrorism offense. I don't know. I don't know what the U.S. criminal code says. Mm -hmm. I know what mine says. And maybe this is one way of getting around it that way. Because I think the prosecutions, you know, I, I dealt a lot with prosecution here in Canada. When you go to court, you want to win. Yeah. You don't go to court to lose. And so in a lot of cases, if you can't make that determination as to what the underlying motivation is, you're not going to try and, and prove it in court because you might lose. And then you lose. Yeah, yeah, we've actually had very famous cases in the United States. I think it was, um, uh, do, you, do you remember hearing about Zimmerman? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so he walked not because he didn't do anything wrong, but I think a large part of that was that they tried to get him on first degree murder, which requires a, a level of predetermination that they could, yeah. they, the prosecution couldn't prove. And if you can't get yeah. him on that, you can say like, okay, 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 we messed that up. Let's come back now and let's try manslaughter. Let's try second degree murder. Like you, you get yeah. one shot and you have to go with the charges yeah. that you think are the strongest. Yeah. And I think that would work. We, you know, we've had a case like that here. In fact, we've had very cases where terrorism is a charge on the books and we've had a very success. And I don't want to go on to the, you know, the problems with the Canadian court system, but you know, there have been times where the people say, no, we can prove beyond reasonable doubt this person killed or tried to kill somebody. We don't need to prove why, mm -hmm. because you know, six murders, he's, he's already sentenced to 40 years in jail anyway. Mm -hmm. Does it matter that he's a terrorist or not? No, it doesn't matter because he's been found guilty of murder and he's not going to see the light of day for, for decades anyway. So end of the day, who cares? But mm -hmm. I, yeah, we've had the same argument here. If you're white, you're a crazy guy. If you're brown, you're a terrorist. We have the exact same debate here. So yeah. it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. I think when I look at terrorism, um, one of the things, I guess I'm not as interested in, in the punishment side of things so much as I am in the prevention side of things, which yeah. is stupid to say. Most people would probably agree with that. <laughs> um, yeah. One of the things that, that I always thought was crazy, um, I, I remember back in, in the very, very early, uh, man, 20, 20, God, I don't even remember. When did we start talking about ISIS? Was it uh, about 2011, 2013? Was it a decade ago? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Um, it, it always seemed like the what you always heard was that you know poor people with no other options you know would run over and fight for ISIS in the Middle East. Um, but when you started to look at who actually was going over, it it wasn't yeah. actually poor people. It was sometimes middle class people. But that this yeah. idea of being like um like kind of like disaffected, a loser. A loser. Yeah. A loser. That like society is kind of like shitting on you and blah blah blah. Yeah. Um. I. It really bothers me how anti certain groups of people like the rhetoric in this country has gotten, especially when Trump came in and, and did that that seven country. Uh, I oh, don't yeah. want to call it the Muslim ban, but the attempted yeah. Muslim ban. Um, yeah. And it's like, damn, I, I feel like stuff like that contributes to so much more ill will um, than anything else we could do. And it, it really bothers me that we take that approach sometimes. I'm really glad to raise that point because um, I did a lot of work when I was with the security service. In fact, my first book was all about that, about you know what what is it that drives people to do this kind of stuff? And we found quite categorically, at least in Canada, it wasn't about previous criminal records. It wasn't about mental health. Are there mental health issues? Absolutely. But I don't know what the stats are in the States, Stephen, but in Canada, one in five people has a serious mental health issue. So they're probably similar in your country. So, you know, odds on that some of the people who go become terrorists are going to have mental issues. It wasn't about poverty. It wasn't about lack of education. It wasn't about marginalization, alienation. Most people that we were looking at and, and who went out to commit acts of terrorism or leave the country to join groups like ISIS were kind of average Canadians, just like they're average Americans. Yeah. And see that, but see, people don't want to hear that. They want to hear that they're the losers, that marginalized, and that they're evil. They're like and like, yeah, they're, it's, not, like they're not like that's the most important part is that we could never be those types that's of right. people. Yeah. And I, let, me, let me tell you a story. So when I was in high school, which was a gazillion years ago, mm -hmm. I remember learning about uh, farm workers in California that were being, uh, Cesar Chavez was trying to organize Mexican migrant farm workers who were being treated like shit by the, by the farmers in the area, right? Conditions mm -hmm. and pesticides. And I remember getting really angry about that. I was 14 years old. Had I been able to find Me California on a map and I wasn't 14 years old, I would take the next Greyhound bus down there to help those people fight against these evil you know, mega farm owners kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was an average middle-class kid growing up in an average middle-class Canadian town, yeah. right? I wasn't alienated. I wasn't marginalized. wasn't living in poverty. That's the same thing for terrorism. We see that again and again and again. Now, are there differences? Yeah. Like places like France, they probably have a higher proportion of, of people that are kind of on unemployment because, well, that just happens to be the state of a lot of people in France and that community. But in your country and in my country, these tend to be the middle-class people, mostly with post-secondary education, doing well and we've got guys that are making six figure salaries went over to join isis and blow themselves up like mm -hmm. why would you do that yeah well it's because you because because it's a cause because you 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 buy into it and what isis was really really good at and they're still really good at it is is talking about grievance so something's wrong we know who's responsible oh and by the way your religion demands you that you take action to do something about it 
So that's what their their propaganda was brilliant. You got to give them credit for it. Mm -hmm. Propaganda was very slick. It was, you know, it was pervasive. There was a gazillion messages out there and they they sold what they were selling and people signed up. You know, there are upwards of 40,000 people around the world went to join ISIS. Yeah, one it's seen that before yeah it's really scary to me um it feels very um not dystopian i don't know what the word would be but to, to watch some of the the those isis recruitment videos were very high production value very oh, well God, put yeah. together yeah they look like they were put together like a marketing agency you know like they yep. have the cool music they're obviously using high quality equipment they've got editing they're on their adobe cloud and everything like yeah it was really scary to see how effective a lot of that advertising yeah. was uh, both in appearance and then obviously in an actual effect of like drawing people down to that region yeah. of the world yeah and the other thing we've seen in a lot of cases, and I just read some stuff recently. The other thing we're really bad at is um, your average person doesn't know when somebody's going off the reservation, going off the ranch. Mm -hmm. There are always signs that somebody is going down that pathway. And, they, you know, they, they, whenever something happens, you, they talk to the neighbors and family. Oh, I never knew Steve was, was feeling this way. He showed no signs of wanting to go and kill 13 people in, in, a, in a food court. Then you go, well, yeah, yeah, but a month ago, he started saying this. And, and two months ago, we noticed he was going to certain websites and he stopped talking to us. And his best friends were all kind of weirdos he would hang out with. There are always signs to do that. There's a, a guy at San Diego called Reed Malloy that talks about leakage. And yeah, they're, these people give off signs that they're going down this pathway where they're going to contemplate the possibility of violence. The problem is, well, there's many problems. People don't know what the signs are, or they're afraid to acknowledge it, or they don't want to get in trouble or they don't want to get their loved one in trouble, or they want to get involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But there's always people that, that there's people give off some kind of odors that they're changing and they're not changing for the good. Yeah. It's a matter of, of educating people on what those signs are. So they don't call, out, call 911, call the FBI, call the RCMP, call somebody. If you've got concerns that your son, daughter, best friend, Baker is, uh, is going down the wrong pathway. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm not as familiar with those. It seems like a lot of those signals could be confused with something else, but uh, yeah, I've never, oh, never looked and at that, it. And, but that, and that's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, see, the vast majority of people who, we call it radicalization. It's a shitty term, but we're stuck with it. Sure. The vast majority of people that radicalize never do a damn thing. Yeah. They don't buy a gun. They don't get on a plane. They don't strap on a bomb. They're, we, we, they're basically, they're wankers. They just, they don't, they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's a real challenge for your law enforcement security. You know, to do anything how, about it. Do you monitor them? Yeah, because you can't arrest somebody for posting no, stupid memes no, online about can't. killing Jews, right? Yeah. Your, your First Amendment, we have a, it's not quite the same here. Wait. Speech, so, oh, wait, you might you cut off for a second. Them, sorry, but if you don't, if you don't monitor them mm -hmm. and they do go do something bad, then it's your fault. Why weren't you monitoring them? Why yeah. weren't you following them? Why weren't you investigating them? Mm -hmm. So it's a real tough call. You know, we've got freedoms. We've got our charter of rights in Canada. You have your constitution. And it's there for damn good reasons. And we're, and we're very happy. We live in countries that have those things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we don't want anyone to get killed. And so you know, that, that fine balance between, you know, there's concern here about not, not enough to investigate or arrest, not enough to make charges. Mm -hmm. Where do you draw that line? And I, I think if somebody had the answer to that, that'd be great because I don't think there's an answer to it. Okay. This leads into a good question. I'm a tech guy. You're a counterterrorism guy. So there must be disagreement here. Um, we don't talk about them anymore. But Snowden leaked a whole bunch of information regarding how counterintelligence works in the United States. Now, I imagine that you, as someone that works in counterintelligence, is probably pretty happy to have the most tools available to you as possible to like sift through populations of people to make sure that people aren't being radicalized or trying to plot yeah. something. How, how does a government responsibly draw a line there when, wow. yeah, in, in terms of like, what is a responsible amount of surveillance on your own citizens yeah. and what types of things do we pursue? Um, and more specifically, so for instance, in the United States, we have something called a no-fly list, right? Yeah, well, that's a terrible idea. Yeah, <laughs> you, can get, idea. you can get on the no-fly list though with no oversight. I don't go to court yeah. for that. I'm not charged yeah. with anything or even indicted. Yeah. I just, am, yeah, what do, you, what do you do for that? Yeah, Yeah. so I mean, okay, I'll start with a no-fly list. I, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. No-fly is a stupid idea. Uh, we have a kid in Canada who's six years old who happens to have the same name as the guy in the no-fly list. And every time he gets on a plane, mm -hmm. he gets pulled aside. He's six years old, sure. right? I mean, come on, let's let's exercise some basic you know, judgment here. The six-year-old kid's probably not going to be the guy that you need to worry about. Uh, so the no-fly list is a really bad idea. There's other tools we could use. Um, in terms of surveillance, yeah, not surprisingly, I wasn't a real big fan of Snowden. Um, but I, I do think this is a really tough call. So, you know, for most people, I think it's okay. I, I think most people don't care. 
that the government is 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 vacuuming up their emails and all that kind of because I don't think most people care. Some people think you know. Well, they, they let Google and Facebook do it for free. I agree with you. Well, Even though people yeah. will come out and say they hate it a lot, they'll gladly trade off their information for some level of convenience to sync their products across fifteen different phones and laptops. Yeah, I agree. Well, exactly. And I'm not sure this is going to help some of your listeners, but I'll say it anyway. You know, people like like me that used to work in that business, we could give a rat's ass about ninety nine point nine 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 percent of what we collected mm -hmm. because it just wasn't of any interest to us. It just, it wasn't threat related or it wasn't feeding into some kind of, you know, significant policy, it got ignored. Mm -hmm. It didn't get processed. It just got ignored kind of thing. So some people aren't okay with that. The, the mere fact it's being collected and stored somewhere is, is a problem for them. Because mm -hmm. what if, you know, what if, the, what if the fascists come to power? Or what if, you know, Big Brother takes over and all of a sudden all my emails from the 1960s are being read again? I don't live in that kind of universe. I don't know if you do. I think some Maybe, maybe they do. Well, I'm the not US, sure it's a great, great answer. Yeah, but. those fears were stoked a little bit. I'm pretty sure that most of these claims were bullshit. But there was um, there was a huge fear at one point that the Obama administration's IRS was targeting conservative groups in the United States for IRS audits. I'm pretty sure later it came out that there was some bullshit glitch. That's trying to me, that, me like bullshit to me. And yeah, I, that's that's conspiracy theory. But mm -hmm. you know the problem is, is that conspiracy theories are a lot, lot more sexy and a lot more fun to listen to than non-conspiracy theories. Right? Yeah, and drive public and, opinion and how, sometimes. So yeah, and how, yeah, and how do you how do you disprove them? Mm -hmm. you know, misinformation, disinformation, fake information, fake news, that kind of stuff. But yeah, from a security intelligence perspective, I can just tell you that we had way too many important things to do in our time, and then worry about whether you know Aunt Sally's. Uh, you know, muffin recipe was being intercepted. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know what, I, I, I don't worry about that. I, I understand there's a philosophical issue behind this, mm -hmm. but from a purely practical one, yeah, it just for, wasn't of course. entertaining by us. I'm curious, how, how do you, um, so are you familiar with like, Sometimes intelligence agencies would very much like to have backdoor, you know, encryption yeah. access to things like iPhones and whatnot. Um, yeah. Now, my understanding is that um, there have been exploits that have existed on the internet that have been discovered by our intelligence agencies. Um, yeah. The the information for the exploits might be left on a staging server somewhere that gets compromised, yeah. taken by other people, and then that gets out or whatever. How do you feel about the the upsides and downsides of that? Like, should should the FBI or the NSA have backdoor encryption into all like U.S. manufactured phones or technology or whatever? No. Um, okay, let's let, let's look at San Bernardino back sure. in 20, 2016. So, you know, the iPhone couldn't get um, decrypted. In fact, the FBI paid someone a shit ton of money to actually decrypt Third it party. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And they got the information eventually. But, you know, if you're in the, in the midst of, a, of an ongoing investigation and, and something bad is really going to happen, and the only piece or the, or the, the kind of the, the cornerstone or the keystone is, is, is encrypted, you can't get it. My, my philosophy is very simple. You should have the ability to go to a court and get a court order. So you have to prove to the court beyond reasonable doubt that this information is really, really important in this investigation. And if the court says yes, and by the way, courts will mostly say no to these things because the courts recognize privacy issues. If the court says yes, then yes, the manufacturer should should be forced to provide the information on that one phone, on that one time to the law enforcement or security intelligence agency that wants it. So not blanket black backdoor, you know, sort of hacks or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. It's case by case basis. Now, the thing is, it would force the manufacturer to at least build in that as a possibility. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The big pushback would be that, well, yeah. now you're telling me that, yeah, yeah, that Apple can get into all of my devices, which would necessitate the the backdoor breaking, basically. And, of and, and lots of people that would then not buy Apple. They go to a technology that refuses to do that, right? But mm -hmm. to me, it's, it's no different than getting a warrant to intercept your telephone calls, right? We, we, we have expectations of privacy in, mm -hmm. you know, in the Western world, and those are great, but... If it, you know, if if the if the if push comes to shove, the sh if the shit's gonna hit the fan, mm -hmm. we have mechanisms whereby we can say we need to intercept. So some, you know, your telephone calls mm -hmm. because we have reasonable grounds to believe you're engaged in plotting a criminal act or terrorist act or whatever, and the court can say yes or no. And I it, guess the the big difference there would be that like. Um, intercept like a telephone call. I would have no reason to expect a telephone call to be a 100% secure encrypted line of communication. Somebody right. else could be listening on the other end. They could have it on speakerphone. They could be recording it themselves. Yeah. But for information that I put into my phone, if I put something into here and the drive is encrypted, I should have a reasonable mm -hmm. expectation that if I died, this is never ever ever getting unlocked. So it seems like those two things are, are quite different in terms of like um, the implication. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can see that. But again, mm -hmm. I, I think that you know the the number of occasions on which. Um, a law enforcement, a government agency has the need for this, I think are much less frequently than people think. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, I think if you prove, again, it's the reasonable argument, right? Mm -hmm. Would a reasonable man or woman believe this to be the case? And if you can prove to a court that this is the case, I think we should have that because otherwise, if, if people die, then people say, well, why didn't you have access? Well, because it was encrypted. Well, who's responsible for that? So you get into these arguments and I don't know, are you okay with 
I don't know, 100 people dying in a, in a food court innocently because the FBI couldn't get to someone's phone? I don't know. I don't think I am. I think, so this is a really hard one, but like we kind of make these calculations a lot in in, in society. So for instance, like I, I yeah. believe that the government probably has the resources to stop over half the crimes that are committed today, you know, if we were to expand the security state such that it encompassed so many parts of our life, right? But we, we right. make that decision that like, well, we're not willing right. to trade that level of freedom, right? I guess like my big concern is that like, in, in Western worlds, I, I'm so hesitant to say this with a Trump administration, but I don't think that like this massive widespread spread abuse would, would happen. But if Apple is going to make a concession to the U.S. government saying like, OK, fine, you know, we've made a key. Bring us a phone. We'll open it for you, blah, blah, blah. Um, we are OK with that. But how do we feel when countries like China do that or Russia yeah. do that or no, Vietnam? Does no, it, or like, no, no. They, yeah. no, those are great. Those are great, great points. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we tend to play by the rules. Uh, those countries don't. Yeah. And I think that, you know, uh, yeah, that's so why I would disagree with Apple saying that China, oh, yeah, we can do it. it. But to me, you know, Apple would say to China, you haven't shown us beyond a reasonable doubt that you need this information. So go screw yourself kind of thing. So I don't I don't like the the universal backdoor. I like the case by case backdoor. I don't know if that's feasible. I'm not taking yeah, I, yeah. you know, I, I can't spell technology. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be really careful here. But if it's possible to do that yeah. on a case by case basis, I think that I think that that mechanism should be available. Absolutely. Yeah. My, my assumption would be that especially given how much we wrangle IP or China, China wrangles IPs from us and everything and the technological sabotage and uh, cyber infiltration, and everything that countries like Iran and China are engaged in, that if, if Apple were to create that kind of like unlock mechanism, it would only be a matter of time until some country like yeah. that were to get a hold of it. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I'm not, I see your point there, but mm -hmm. then again, inevitably it'll, it'll probably all be available. I mean, unless we get into quantum computing, which I understand is basically unbreakable because it, in the minute that you, you screw around with it, you, the person knows it's been screwed around with. So you, you know, abandon that kind of communication, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, this is a tough one. I don't yeah. think we're going to get an answer to that anytime soon. Yeah. It's yeah, there, there. It's a cost, whichever side you side on, you, yep. you have to eat a, a bullet on some bad costs that suck. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, kind of in the same line of questioning, kind of. Um, so we had an issue with Abu Ghraib over in Iraq. We had an issue with yep. Guantanamo Bay. Um, yep. Do you think that foreign terrorists, do you think that they should be afforded rights in terms of like how we approach questioning them, you know, imprisoning them, releasing them? Or do you think these guys are treated as something different? This is more like, I guess not like a counterterrorism question, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, so as I said earlier at the outset, I a terrorist is a good terrorist. Um, you take out a guy in a drone strike and you take him out and not his family and not innocent civilians, which happens more often than people like to admit. Oh, yeah. I got no problem. Especially got, no in problem. Yemen today, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got no problem with that. I got no problem with that at all. I think, you know, these, these people are definitely, you know, they, they, they rather kill you than say hi to you kind of thing. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Once you've actually captured them, which is not a really great thing to do at the best of times, I think that you have to treat them as you would any other people. I think they do have rights. Uh, because if we don't, then basically we lower ourselves to their level because they're not going to treat us with any kind of modicum of modesty. If we were, you look what happened to the ISIS prisoners, right? They were, they were given orange jumpsuits and they were beheaded. Well, where did the orange jumpsuits come from? Gee, let me think. How about Guantanamo Bay? So they were basically saying to us, we're going to do it to you, you do it to you what you did to us. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a, that's a good precedent to set. So I do think that they have rights. I think we ha they, they, they have a right to stand trial. But if you can take it out earlier on the battlefield, I, I'm not shedding a tear. Sorry. I hate to be, I hate to be callous. Mm -hmm. But I have no problem with that. Okay. Um. I. I guess like one. One final question. I think we've covered most sure. of the terror stuff. Do you have? Are you familiar at all with the the Uyghur Muslim situation in China? Very much China? so. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Um. This is one of those things where it feels to me, especially because it's so hard to get any information out of China. Oh yeah. yeah um. Yeah. We all go back to the, the, the 1940s in our head, and we would all like to think that, like, if we would have known that the Nazi death camps existed, we would have been there yeah, immediately. Yeah. Of course we would have gone, and we couldn't let that happen under our watch. What the fuck, guys? We, but, but we did know it. We, did, we didn't go in until 45. That's what we Yeah. Well, and then also, it <laughs> may be potentially, it seems like it, something like that, if not at that level, if not has exceeded that level. I don't know, like, what level of reporting or underreporting has happened. Could be going on right now in China, and the whole world kind of washes its hands or wrings its whatever hands of it. Yeah, what what are your what are your thoughts on that? I'm curious. Which is an abominable decision by all of us. And you know what? We're kowtowing to Chinese economic interests. Mm -hmm. uh, even most Muslim states are basically kissing China's ass because they don't want to upset them because of the One Belt One Road Initiative and all the all the money China's all the loans and money they're pouring into the region. This is a it's a genocide, and it's what people are using. They are trying to erase the a culture. culture. Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, you know, and I I wrote about it in my third book of what they're doing there. And, and, the, and we should be we should be calling out for what it is. 
the, the problem is, is that if you go back a few years, there was terrorism carried out by Uyghur Islamist extremists in China. Mm-hmm. I have a whole list of attacks on my third book, so I don't want to go over that. But so there was a real terrorist problem. The problem is that China has taken some terrorist acts, which were terrorist acts, and said, OK, the whole population can't be trusted. We have to we have to erase the whole population to eliminate the possibility that we'll have one or two more terrorist attacks occurring in our country in the near future. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is, like I say, it is a cultural genocide. And it is, and, and they're lying like you wouldn't believe. Oh, you know, people want to be here. It's vocational training. They're all happy. Look at, you know, people are now being, being, being sent to these centers because they happen to have Islamic literature in their homes. You tell me what it has to do with terrorism. Watching, it doesn't have anything to do with it at all. I think Vice did. It was either Vice. I think it was Vice had sent some undercover people through some of those cities to record. And oh my God, the uh, like some of the empty areas, the oh, yeah. giant They've schools. They've raised mosques. Yeah, yeah, with all the children like sitting in the. Yeah, oh my God, yeah. it looks terrifying. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. it is definitely a genocide of a, of a almost biblical scale. And the fact that not more is being done about it, I think, speaks to our inability to separate our political and economic interests from our human rights interests. And, mm-hmm. You know, I'm associated with a, with a human rights center in Montreal. And, you know, we saw it before in Rwanda, right? Look what happened in Rwanda in 94. Look what happened, you know, in, in Ukraine in the 1930s. Look what happened to the Holocaust. 75th anniversary just took place last week. Mm-hmm. Are we sitting back again and just kind of ignoring this thing? I think it's a shame. I really do. Yeah. But, you know, money, money talks. And, and, and I, I hate to say that. I hate to dismiss it as that. But no, I mean, the Chinese should be. But what do you get? How, okay. That, we all agree we should do something. What are we going to do? Where do you start? Well, my this is another so another a broad policy problem around the world that I have is that it seems like when when things get scary, so whether there's economic unrest or civil unrest or political unrest, when things get scary, it feels like people tend to look inward rather yeah. than looking outward. So yeah. I look at things like current U.S. state of economic policy, tariffing everybody, sanctioning everybody, or yeah. you know, foreign policy, saying fuck you to all of our allies, not want to work with anybody. Um, yeah. When you look at things like the United Kingdom, Brexit, yeah. you know, wanting to yeah. leave, fuck that, this is horrible. That while everybody nice, like nice. looks inward, when, when you look at a country like China, the only way that you can deal with them would be through some sort of leveraging of like these multinational agreements. You can't do it on yeah. your own. Yeah. yeah, but we just don't no, have, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, isolationism is, is a big thing. We don't see it as much here in Canada. Um, our last election, the people that were kind of advocating that pretty well lost, mm-hmm. which is a good thing. But yeah, Brexit, you talk about Brexit, you're talking to people in France who want the same thing. There's, there's parties in Germany that want the same thing. Of course, under the Trump administration, that's not the solution. But I understand the human emotion behind it. Yeah, You kind of look after your own. We talked about before, right? What does your average taxpayer care about? Am I safe? Are my kids safe? Mm-hmm. Is my house still worth so much money? Do I have a job? Do I have a car? Blah, blah, blah. What's happening in China? Where's China? Why do I care? I, I don't. I don't mean to be dismissive, but your average person just doesn't care yeah. because it doesn't affect them personally. But at a bigger level, foreign policy. We've talked about foreign policy a lot today. That's where you have to care because they can't be allowed to get away with this because it, it is absolutely disgusting. Mm-hmm. And and the lies that they're trying to hide it behind are equally as disgusting. So, I've met I've met Uyghur Canadians here who you know, are being pressured. You know, don't talk about it here because your family back home might get might get hurt. Mm-hmm. So they're they're everywhere. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it seems like right now, I guess, so as a final broad point, I guess you can kind of talk about a little bit. It it, it feels like the world is moving in a pretty bad direction, um, in terms of how we are relating to each other, in terms of how we're coming together on, you know, foreign policy decisions that like maybe, maybe post-World War II is what my historical knowledge is very bad, but it feels like post-World War II was kind of like the height of listen, you know, we fucked a lot of people up. We're going to be friends now, okay? We're not going to go the World War Run route. We're going to be friends with fucking Japan. You're our yeah. bros now. Everybody's cool. We're yeah. all going to work together. Um, the start of the European Union, the United Nations, NATO, all of this. And it seems like, it feels like we've been on a trend where a lot of those alliances are starting to fall apart. Um, do you think in the in, do you think in our direction forward, is that trend going to continue? Is something going to reverse it? Like, I hope not. You're absolutely right, though, about, you know, post-World War II. We, we did it right. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't leave Germany. We didn't we didn't saddle Germany with a gazillion dollars of debt like we did for the First World War, which led to the rise of the Nazi Party in the 1930s. We did isolate Japan. We helped them rebuild kind of thing. And now they're our strongest allies. European Union, the same thing. You know, we, we had the Cold War. We, we you know, we, we won. Right? They lost. Mm-hmm. The whole thing fell apart in the late 80s, early 90s kind of thing. And then we kind of lost our way. It's kind of like, you know... We need like an are... enemy. <laughs> well, yeah. You remember, remember Francis, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history? Right. History is over. Well, it's not over. I would say that, you know, go back to the Arab Spring in 2011. Everyone was pretty optimistic about that. That's only nine years ago. Look where we are now. Yeah. None of the Arab Spring countries are doing Egypt's under a dictatorship. Uh, Syria is a shit show. 
Uh, Tunisia's not doing very well. I mean, all these countries are kind of struggling. So we kind of, we kind of, we're very much pendular, aren't we, as humans? We're on a kind of a high, then we go down low. I kind of hope that this is the, we're kind of bottoming out in terms of this populist movement. There are some signs, especially in your in Europe, that the parties that are not in favor of isolationism are kind of on the rise right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll see what happens in your country in the, with the election in November. My country it tends to be bucking the trend that we're not big into populism and isolationism for the most part. Let's hope that we're that, that we're, on the, we're on the upswing rather than the downswing. I don't want to make any predictions, but I'm an optimist by by nature. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just hoping that you know, we realize this is not a good way to go, and uh, we'll figure things out uh, and do things better in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have any final closing thoughts or anything, or do you? And then you can promote a if you have a Twitter uh, or a book or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think this is a great forum, and I, I again thanks for having me on. I mean, this is really important to have these discussions in a polite, uh, you know, not insulting and uh, condemnatory way. I'm really happy to hear that uh, kind of the kind of the tone we had back and forth. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think this is a, this is a great a great forum to have these ideas talked about because if we don't talk about them, and we and we leave this to people that don't know what they're doing. Because they have the best interests and the and the power and the influence, yeah. we're not going to end up in a, in a happy place. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, what's your like number one platform that you wish you could have? Like, if you want people to follow you or want to keep up with news or information, or so my website has all my blogs, podcasts, everything. It's www.borealisthreatenrisk.com, and they can reach me at uh, Twitter at, at Borealis Saves. It's it's I use at Borealis Saves because I'm trying to save people, and I'm a very substandard goalie in hockey. Kind of it kind of goes for both of them. Bore okay, let me add bo- at Borealis Saves. At okay, hold on, let me get these. Oh yeah, Borealis um, saves, threat yeah. and risk dot com. That's me, yep. And at Borealis Saves on Twitter. Okay, cool, gotcha. All right, awesome. Oh, I'll have my okay. people on Okay, cool. Well, hey, I okay. really appreciate the conversation. Um, if you're, fr- I don't know who reached out between who our mutual contact was or whatever. Um, but if you ever hear me or they point you to something that I say that you either super disagree with or whatever, feel free to come on and let me know. I'm always trying to gather information about this stuff because there's it's so complicated. And there's so it much is. going on it all the is. time. That, Absolutely. Yeah. No, again, again, thanks for the opportunity, Stephen. If you want to talk in, I'm more than happy. To- Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the okay. conversation. Yeah, take care. Eh? Yep. Bye. Bye. Actually, when you, hear it you, you actually, when, when, when you listen to it, you have to actually briefly go unconscious. <laughs>